Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. The EV Club has been running for a few years now. Um, we're almost almost to three years uh, since the pandemic started in many parts of the world. Um, and my name is Kenneth Whitwer. I'm going to be your host today. And we're very privileged to have two presenters with us this week who are going to be telling us about a topic that I enjoy quite a bit, and that is the, the relationship of viruses and extracellular vesicles. Um, so we can have enveloped viruses, we can have non-enveloped viruses, and both of these major classes will have some, some sort of relationship with EVs. Um, so before we get started, I just want to remind everybody that you can ask questions and make comments in the chat box. Uh, we will get to you then at the end of the presentation, allow you to unmute yourselves, um, allow you to also show your video if you'd like. Um, but um, let's go ahead and get started. So Esther Naltatun, um, thank you for joining. And I'd like to uh, to ask you to just give a, a brief introduction here um, before uh, Kira starts the, the talk. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Ken. And uh, thank you also uh, the other organizers uh, uh, for the invitation to us to present at the uh, famous uh, EV Club. Um, the topic today will indeed, as Ken said, uh, uh, viruses and how they influence EV release and EV cargo that is released by host cells. And before Kira will tell you everything about uh, this topic and the paper that we published recently about uh, this topic, uh, I would like to tell in a few minutes how this uh, topic actually uh, is embedded in uh, the research in my research group. Yeah, next one, Kira. So um, throughout the years, uh, one of the topics of my group has been EV technology and fundamental EV biology. And here we really are interested in uh, the molecular contents of extracellular vesicles, uh, subsets present in uh, cell cultures and also in body fluids. We're interested in what kind of signals in post on cells regulate the molecular content of these EVs and also what the targeting specificity is of these EVs. And for this, we use um, more standard uh, uh, techniques to study extracellular vesicles, but we've also used a lot small RNA transcriptomics. We developed uh, technologies for single EV analysis, and uh, we are now also developing uh, proteomic techniques uh, to look at this targeting specificity. Next. So especially in relation to this regulation of molecular content, we've also uh, been doing some explorative uh, studies on uh, EV-associated RNAs as circulating biomarkers. Next. But really in the last uh, couple of years, a major theme in my research group has been the role of EVs in host pathogen interactions. And that is uh, partly uh, the role of EVs that pathogens themselves release uh, and with that communicate with their host, uh, but also uh, on pathogens that actually exploit or subvert uh, the uh, host EV communication. Next one. And what we've done in this area is in collaboration with others, we looked at the uh, EV content and function of uh, parasite EVs and bacterial EVs. But by far the most of the work that has been done in my group has been done on uh, how RNA viruses, and mostly the picorna viruses, uh, interfere in EV release by the host cells. Next one. Well, this work has mainly been done uh, in the last couple of years by uh, both Susanne van der Grijn, Kira, who is uh, now with us today to present, and Zingy Pei. Next one. But the group has now grown, as you can see here in this picture. Next one. And uh, this allows us to uh, answer even more questions in this area. And uh, yeah, you can click them now all, uh, Kira. So uh, the questions that we would like to answer is, uh, first of all, how the virus infections uh, influence the biogenesis of, ex biogenesis of extracellular vesicles. Uh, secondly, how the EVs can influence uh, virus spreading either to neighboring cells or even across uh, cellular barriers, and also how the virus-induced EVs can modulate uh, the function of immune cells. Yeah, next one. So um, what I think about this field is that uh, it, it kind of needs, but also triggers a better integration of the fields of EV biology and virology to really evolve the field of EV virus biology. And I think by answering questions on how viruses influence EV release and function, 
we can uh, get a very important answers both for the field of virology and what is the role of EVs in uh, the virus life cycle and virus induced uh, pathologies, but also uh, answers for the field for, uh, of uh, EV biology because it uh, teaches us uh, what kind of mechanisms there are for the release and content regulation of the extracellular vesicles. Yeah, so the last one, uh, I hand over to uh, Kira, who has uh, been doing a tremendous amount uh, of work in this topic uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, she has been a PhD student in my group, but is now postdoc in the group. And uh, she will tell you more about uh, the virus and host factors that can regulate the release of EV enclosed P. coronavirus. So, Kira, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so like Esther said, my name is Kira. I'm currently uh, one of Esther's postdocs. And like Esther mentioned, one of the primary topics of our research group is the study of extracellular vesicles during virus infection. Now, when a virus infects a cell, this often leads to large structural, metabolic and signaling changes. And this change in cell state can in turn be reflected in the release of EVs with an altered composition of host molecules and in the case of virus infection, the release of EVs containing virus-derived molecules. Now, either of these two EV subsets has in turn the potential to either help boost antiviral defenses or facilitate infection progression. Now, this uh, topic from start to finish is what we as a group study, uh, but for my PhD, I was particularly interested in the release of EVs containing virus-derived molecules. Now, when we talk about EVs containing viral material, uh, we can talk about viral proteins, RNA molecules, but even entire insect virus particles can become part of the EV cargo. Now, this has been especially shown for a wide range of so-called naked virus species, which is a category of viruses that typically consists solely of a protein capsid containing a viral genome. Now, because of their structure, many of these viruses were long relieved to require the induction of host cell lysis to escape the host cell and initiate virus spread. However, uh, a more closer examination has actually revealed that many of these viruses are released as a mix of both free virus particles and virus particles that are packaged within membranes. And via uh, packaging themselves in membranes, these viruses have found a way to escape the cell before uh, or even without the induction of host cell lysis. Now, the resulting particles look very much like an envelope virus, uh, but they are not, uh, which has earned them the nickname quasi-envelope viruses. And we now, in fact, know that what we're looking at here are, in fact, viruses within extracellular vesicles. Now, for some viruses, only a small fraction of all virus particles is released uh, via EVs. For some, it's really the dominant release strategy. But the fact that these particles are formed at all has certain implications for disease. And that is because virus packaging in EV can alter virus-host interaction. Now, to give you some examples, um, when a virus particle is packaged in EV, it's now shielded from the outside environment. And as a result, many EV enclosed viruses were shown to be inaccessible to neutralizing antibodies. In addition, when a virus is packaged in EV, the EV membrane will now take over binding and uptake into the host cell and this, in combination with the fact that these vesicles can package multiple virus particles as well as host molecules and deliver them as one single package, can in turn affect infection efficiency. Uh, and to, to, uh, as an example of this, um, there is one model actually of fecal oral transmission, where it was shown that the EV enclosed form of a virus was even fivefold more infectious than its naked counterpart. Now, finally, vesicles can also affect the type of tissues to which virus particles are preferentially delivered. And it has, for example, been shown for one virus, uh, multiple actually, uh, that virus packaging in EV increases the ability of these virus to cross the blood brain barrier. Now, although these are just examples, they highlight that, in fact, naked virus particles can be more dangerous than their naked counterpart. But despite this fact, there's actually a lot that we don't know about these particles yet. Now, um, at the moment, there's a large uh, research effort of food trying to understand what exactly are the functional differences between virus particle A and virus particle B. And although this is a very relevant and important question, I really hope when I'm talking to an audience of EV biologists uh, that you see this image and that the first question in your mind is, what type of EV is that and how is it formed? Because we often like to draw um, because viruses very simple. You have a virus in a cell and then you have a virus in a vesicle. 
But as physical biologists, we know that cells can affect these many different subsets of EVs, and it's often not clear which of these subsets actually contributes to virus transmission. In addition, we often don't know how virus particles are packaged in these EVs, and we often don't know at uh, what extent the virus particles released in the presence of virus actually resemble those released by non-infected cells uh, that we have been studying already so long. Now, answering these questions is important for several different reasons. Uh, first and foremost, because it will help us identify targets to inhibit the specific form of virus spread. Secondly, it can help us better predict the properties of EV enclosed viruses. Uh, for example, if we know the type of EV these viruses are in, we might already know from other research uh, what kind of cells the, these uh, vesicles are preferentially delivered to. And finally, of course, it helps us understand EV biology, because all a virus does is make use of the machinery present in a host. So if a virus can do it, um, a cell can do it, and maybe we can learn how to do this as well. Now, with this in the back of our minds, um, I want to jump into the paper that we're going to discuss today, which is a paper we published last summer in Nature Communications. And if we simplify the title a bit, um, this paper is basically about trying to identify the virus and host factors that regulate the release of extracellular vesicle and those viruses. Now, of course, we cannot do this for all viruses. Uh, so as the title suggests, we're doing this for one group, um, which is the picorna viruses. Now, picorna viruses form a very large family of viruses. Um, you may have heard about them. Um, they've caused big outbreaks in the past, such as outbreaks of foot and mouth disease, uh, polio, and they still come in the news once in a while for causing local outbreaks of, of disease among children. In total, there are 147 different species of picorna viruses, all of which are positive sense RNA viruses of about 35 nanometers in size. Now, among all these species, we're particularly interested in one, which is the encephalomyocarditis virus, or short EMCV. EMCV is a veterinary pathogen. It's primarily of concern for zoos and wildlife reserves because it can cause fatalities among elephants and primates and many other mammals. And as much as I would really love to save the elephants, um, in fact, the primary reason we're interested in this virus is that it's a very popular model to study coronavirus biology. And this means we know a lot about the virus-host interactions of this virus, and that is necessary for us to be able to try and pinpoint uh, which interactions are important for vesicle release. So in previous work uh, published in Plus Pathogens in 2019, uh, we actually already characterized in detail the EV release in response to EMC virus infection, and we primarily did so using a technique called high-resolution flow cytometry. Now, this technique uh, we perform in our lab uh, using an in-house modified BD influx fax machine. And this machine allows us to analyze uh, fluorescently labeled EVs in the 100 to 200 nanometer range. And this is a technique um, that we published uh, extensively about in the past, if you're interested to know more. Now, using this technique, what we're able to show is that if we compare uh, in uninfected cells, uh, so mock infected cells, compared to virus infected cells, so we see an increase in vesicle production both in the 10k EV pellets and also to a lesser extent in their 100k EV pellets. And along with induction of EVs, we see the induction of vesicle subset that we do not or hardly find produced by mock infected cells. And at least one of the ways in which these EV subsets are different is that they have a higher level of four scattered light. Now, in addition to being physically different, uh, these different EV subsets that we're seeing here are also functionally different. And to show this, what we've done is that we sorted exact amounts of either four scatter low or four scatter high vesicles onto target cells. And in doing so, we were able to show that it's actually the four scatter high vesicles that carry the majority of the EV associated infectivity. And this basically means that not only does EMCV promote the release of EVs, it specifically promotes the release of EV subsets that efficiently package virus particles. Now, of course, this raises the question, how is the release of these EVs regulated? And that brings me to the starting question uh, of the paper we're discussing today, which is, are there EMCV encoded viral proteins that are actively driving the packaging and release of variants into EVs? Now, to address this question, we take a closer look at our EMC virus, and the good news is that it's a relatively simple virus. EMCV only encodes uh, 12 proteins, and all the way at the front of the genome, there's one protein uh, called the leader protein. 
Now, the leader protein is a viral security protein that blocks many different host cell antiviral defenses, including interferon induction, uh, stress granule formation, apoptosis, and many more. And what's interesting is that despite the fact that these sound like very important functions, um, in fact, leader protein is the only protein that is dispensable for virus replication in vitro meaning we can introduce an inactivated mutation into this virus, um, into this protein, resulting in a mutant virus, which, like the wild type, is still able to replicate in cells. Uh, however, we do see that it is slightly less efficient in reducing virus particles because it lost part of its function. Now, what's interesting is that if we don't only look at intracellular virus production, but also take a look at virus release, we see that our mutant virus has a very strong uh, defect in virus um, release from cells. And this defect is a lot bigger than you would expect based on the difference in intracellular virus production. And it was actually this observation that made us um, ask the question, could it be that the activity of the viral leader protein is somehow important for the release of EV enclosed virus? Uh, to address this, um, we infected HeLa cells with both our wild type or our mutant virus. After one hour, we then washed our cells and switched them to EV free medium. And after eight hours, just before the onset of um, virus induced cell lysis, we then isolated our EVs by means of a series of differential ultra centrifugation steps, including the formation of a 10K and 100K pellet. Now, where needed, we also uh, further purified our EVs using OptiPrep density gradient. And the primary purpose of this gradient was to separate EV and EV enclosed virus particles uh, from naked virus particles and proteins that are present at higher density fractions. And this is a technique we have already published before. And if you're interested in it, um, you can read all about it in our Plus Pathogens paper. Now, once we've isolated our EVs, what we've done is that, I don't know if you can see this because there's an image in front, uh, we've analyzed um, uh, different parameters, including EV quantity, uh, EV phenotype, and the viral content of EVs. And we've done so using a combination of different techniques, including high resolution post cytometry, uh, Western blot and mass spec analysis, uh, as well as endpoint dilution assaying. And these techniques you will see come back throughout the presentation. So the first thing we did is take a look at the viral content of our EVs. So what we did is that we took purified 10K EVs and purified 100K EVs that were produced by an equal number of cells. We then made serial, serial dilutions, uh, added them to target cells, and saw whether or not there was an infection. And if we do this for both our wild type virus and our mutant virus, we see that mutation of the leader protein strongly reduces the amount of virus transmitted via 100K EV and almost completely blocks the virus spread by a 10K EV. Now, again, this difference of this defect in EV uh, enclosed uh, virus transmission does not seem to be caused by difference in intracellular virus production, because even if we correct for this, uh, we still see that this really big gap or this defect is still there. Now, of course, um, the fact that we're not seeing uh, transmission of virus uh, via the EVs isolated from a mutant virus infected cell can mean one of two things. One is that EV enclosed viruses are still formed, but they're somehow not able to transmit the infection. And of course, the other option is already that in the formation, something is going wrong, either with packaging or with EV release. And to figure out which of these options was the case in our system, we performed a mass spectrometry analysis of the virus peptides present in our EVs. And if we do this, we actually see that we can detect uh, viral peptides in our wild type uh, infected derived EVs, but we cannot detect them in our mutant derived EVs. Uh, meaning that already in this early step, uh, something is going wrong. Now, of course, the question then becomes, is this a problem with packaging or is this a problem with EV relate? Now, to determine this, we took a closer look at our extracellular particles, and the first technique uh, we use to do this is Western world. So we Western world this for three different markers, CD9, CD63, and flotillin. And what we find is that where we see some signal for our mock derived EVs, we see a strong increase in signal during EVs to wild type infection. But this increase in signal is no longer seen when we infect with our mutant virus. And this is something we see uh, both in 100k EVs, but also the induction of 10k EV release um, appears to be inhibited. Now, of course, with any EV quantification, you always have to do multiple independent techniques, and especially with Western world, you never know if you're looking here at the right EV markers to really make a good uh, quantitative comparison. Therefore, we uh, repeated our analysis now also with flow cytometry. 
And in our case, we do this uh, by first uh, labeling our RVs with a generic dye, in our case, at the CFSE. And we then record the amount of fluorescent events that pass our laser in a fixed time interval of 30 seconds. And by doing so, we were able to show that where our mock infected cells primarily release 100 keVs, induction of 10 keV causes our wild type virus infected cell to release a mix of about 50, 50, 10, 100 keVs. But the EVs released by our mutant virus infected cell are again uh, almost solely 100 keVs. Now, because of this, we decided to take a closer look at exactly how these 100 keVs look. And what we see is that normally during infection, over time, there's an increase in 100 keV production. But this increase we no longer see with our mutant virus here in blue, even at later time points. And along with the loss of this EV induction, we see that we lose um, the formation of our forest get the high vesicle subset that is normally formed. So coming back to our question, yes, it does really seem like the activity of the leader protein uh, can strongly affect EV enclosed virus release in response to infection. And we can explain this, uh, at least in part, by the fact that two subsets of EV that normally package virus particles uh, are in fact no longer formed if you don't have this viral protein present. In fact, uh, the vesicles produced by our mutant virus infected cells um, are uh, basically very similar to those released if there's no infection at all. Now, of course, this is a answer. Um, it's very important because it really shows us that uh, the activity of such um, viral proteins can have a really strong uh, impact on vesicle release, but it is still leaves us a bit wanting. Um, and that's because, um, of course, our mutant virus infected cells are still releasing vesicles. And that begs the question, what exactly is different about these vesicles compared to the ones released by our wild type virus that explains why uh, one uh, packages virus so much more efficiently than the other. Now, to address this question, uh, we decided to do a more detailed proteomic analysis of these EVs. And if we do so, we find that there's a large overlap in proteome, but there are also 44 proteins that are specifically enriched in our wild type virus uh, induced EVs. If we do a go-term analysis on these 44 proteins, we find that they're specifically enriched from uh, proteins belonging to the ergic membrane. Now, the ergic membrane stands for ER to Golgi intermediate compartment, which is a compartment that shuttles membranes uh, between these two organelles. In addition, what's interesting is that the ergic is actually indicated as uh, the membrane source for forming all the vagosomes. And the reason uh, we were triggered by this is that we actually find two proteins, uh, namely SAC22B and SNAP23, that are enriched uh, in our 44 proteins, both of which has been indicated as regulators of secretory autophagy. So I dropped in on the term secretory autophagy. We're going to take a small intermezzo to talk about this because to understand the rest of the presentation, it's very important that we're all on the same page as to what this exactly means. Uh, let's start with autophagy in general. Um, autophagy is, um, in principle, a decoratory pathway. Uh, during autophagy, a double membrane vesicle is formed that encloses uh, part of the cargo of the cytoplasm, forming an autovagosome, which then fuses with the lysosome to deliver its cargo for degradation. Now, in contrast to this canonical autophagy pathway, when we talk about secretory autophagy, we're actually talking about unconventional protein secretion that uses the autophagic machinery. Uh, to release proteins that otherwise could not be secreted either in soluble form or via packaging in EVs. Now, many different pathways have been proposed uh, via which secretory autophagy can lead to the release of cargo molecules in EVs. Um, and these are, uh, for example, the direct fusion of autovagosomes with the plasma membrane, the fusion of autovagosomes with endosomal compartments, resulting in formation of hybrid compartments on amphisomes, which are then uh, destined for release. Or, in some cases, it's even shown that canonical autophagy is not even required, as autophagy-related proteins can be directly recruited to the endosomal system and here help in vesicle budding and release. And these different pathways you might, may have heard already discussed in previous journal clubs as well, under terms such as SALI and LDL. Now, what all these pathways at least have in common um, is that they will result in the release of autophagy-related proteins, such as the protein LC3, either within vesicles or uh, alongside extracellular vesicles. So, why am I telling you all of this? Um, and that is because uh, the proteome of our vesicles actually made us wonder whether a secretory autophagy might be activated in response to our virus infection. 
Like I said, uh, secretory autophagy should lead uh, to a secretion of autophagy-related proteins. We didn't really see them coming up in our uh, mass spec analysis, but it is possible that we don't see this because it can be difficult to detect. Therefore, we went to the good old-fashioned uh, Western world. And when we Western world for our marker LC3 in our 100,000 G pellets, we actually see no LC3 for our mock virus, uh, mock infected cells. Uh, but we do see LC3 released specifically uh, for our wild type virus infected cells, meaning that our virus induces secretory autophagy. We see it can only do so in presence of the viral leader protein. Now, for those of you paying attention, we do see we don't see only one LC3 band. Uh, we actually see multiple bands that likely correspond to different forms of LC3, including the unlipidated and the lipidated form. Uh, to see which, if any, of these proteins is actually in EVs, um, we did two control experiments. One is that we treated our uh, EV pellet with proteins K. And if we do this, we see that one band of LC3 is lost, but one band is actually resistant to proteinase K treatments, meaning this is really enclosed in the lumen of EVs. Now, uh, likewise, uh, we see that if we run these pellets on a density gradient, that part of the LC3 signal stays in the high density fractions, while part of the LC3 signal uh, floats up together with EVs. And based on the height of these bands, uh, we uh, think we can actually conclude that uh, not only do we see the activation of secretory autophagy, uh, but we really re see the release of uh, LC3, and specifically LC3-2 positive EVs. Now, of course, the question then becomes, is this something that is important? Um, so because we see that in these wild type virus infected cells, we have secretory autophagy and we see a lot of EV enclosed virus release. But what we don't yet know is whether these are two independent events or whether they are in fact causally linked. Now, showing this is more difficult than you would uh, expect, and that's because to inhibit secretory autophagy, people often rely on inhibiting autophagy altogether. But autophagy can have uh, many, um, many roles in virus replication, or virus replication, organelle formation. So these experiments are often very difficult to interpret. Now, what's sort of nice is that we have actually found a virus now that is not able to induce secretory autophagy, is not really able to release even enclosed virus. Meaning we have now a very nice model system in which we can try to activate secretory autophagy in a gain of function experiment and try and see whether this would affect the amount of EV enclosed virus that is released. Now, to do this, we treated ourselves with a chemical compound named Apimot, which is an inhibitor of the enzyme PIK5 and will result in a inhibition of lysosomal regeneration. Now, if you do this for long enough, about 24 hours, it's been shown this drug treatment actually induces secretory autophagy. Uh, and we actually also see that in our uh, virus infection system, we can restore LC3 secretion with this drug treatment. And this is actually one of the few drugs that you can do this with without actually inhibiting your virus infection altogether. Now, what's really interesting is that we see that along with the rescue of LC3 release, we actually also see an increase in the amount of the enclosed viruses that these cells release. And this is not due to an increase in overall virus production, because if anything, we see that intracellular virus production goes down, meaning that the induction secretory autophagy uh, is actually able to rescue a uh, virus released by our mutant virus. Now, of course, with any type of drug treatment, you always have to be very careful for unwanted uh, and off-target drug effects. And in our case, we're working with a drug that prevents lysosomal regeneration, meaning that we have to take into account that maybe somehow we're also, uh, in the end, inhibiting lysosomal degradation, which is a process we know can affect vesicle release. Now, to therefore verify that the results we're seeing here are really due to secretory autophagy and not an unintended effect on, on the lysosomal system, uh, we repeated these experiments using bethylomycin, which is a drug that specifically inhibits lysosomal degradation. And what we see is that if we do this um, in this treatment, that uh, both apicamods uh, and bethylomycin uh, are able to uh, boost vesicle release, but only apicamods in our system is able to efficiently induce secretory autophagy, uh, whereas we only see this a little bit or not at all for the short-term bethylomycin treatment that we're doing. Now, what's interesting is that we see that only apicamods, but in fact not bethylomycin, is able to enhance EV enclosed virus release. Meaning that the effect we're seeing here is not due to the vesicle numbers, but it really seems to be that a virus packaging itself in EVs is promoted uh, by secretory autophagy.
So this is something um, we've been now been studying in the context of our mutant virus, um, in which we have to activate secretory cell protein by means of drug treatment. But we know that during wildlife virus infection, uh, the activation of the secretory cell protein pathway uh, is somehow facilitated by the presence of this leader protein. However, we don't know yet how the leader protein is able to activate secretory autophagy. Now, one thing it might not be too crazy to think is that the leader protein might actually be doing this in a very similar way um, as what most drugs are doing. And that is because many viruses are known to inhibit lysosome acidification or to inhibit autovagosome lysosome fusion as a way to prevent virus particles by, from being degraded by the whole cell. And um, this is actually the same type of, of system that um, we normally try to, to interfere with if we want to try to activate secret autophagy in uh, laboratory settings. Now, to see if our leader protein would indeed have an effect on, on this lysosome or autophagy degradation, uh, the first thing we did is to look at a uh, lysosome tracker staining of ourselves. Now, this dye um, shows acidic compartments, including the lysosomes. And if we do the staining, we see that both our wildlife virus or our mutant virus doesn't really seem to affect uh, the presence of acidified lysosomes, meaning that it is not very likely that in our case, secretory topology is triggered uh, by leader induced lysosomal defects. So if it's not the lysosomes themselves that are really um, affected, it is then maybe the delivery of all the vagosomes to lysosomes um, that is not going well. To assess this, we make use of a reporter assay for autovagosome lysosome fusion, which is an assay in which LC3 is fused to a green and red fluorescent molecule. And when autophagy is activated, these molecules are aggregated in autovagosomes, which will then result in the formation of a green and red fluorescent spot. Now, when these autovagosomes fuse with lysosomes, uh, the resulting drop in pH will cause the green signal to disappear, but the red signal to remain meaning that now these compartments are red only dots. And we can use this assay to look at the ratio between uh, red and green dots or red only dots as an indication of how efficiently our autofagosomes are delivered to the lysosome. Now, if we do this analysis uh, during infection, what we see is that over the course of our wild virus infection here in red, we actually see an accumulation of green dots, whereas we do not see this with our mutant virus meaning that there's accumulation of LC3 in non-acidified puncta. So the fact that we see that accumulation of LC3 could mean that our LC3 um, in our autophagosomes um, somehow can no longer reach the lysosome and cannot be delivered here. Uh, one of the most straightforward uh, explanations for this uh, would be that the leader effect inhibits or prevents uh, truly autophagosome lysosome fusion. And it is, of course, possible that when these autophagosomes are no longer able to be delivered to a lysosome, that instead uh, they have nowhere else to go and then uh, are released from the cell. Uh, to see if this model would be correct, uh, we first try to see if we could prove that IMSV really does induce a block in autophagosome lysosome fusion. And secondly, we try to see if we could demonstrate that this block is, in fact, important for the induction of secretory autophagy. Yeah. To do this, uh, we treated ourselves with a drug called rapamycin, which both stimulates uh, autophagy formation, but also autovagosome lysosome fusion. And if we do this, we see that uh, if we look at our report cells, there's a lot of uh, red dots appearing, meaning that we have, in fact, uh, improved delivery of autovagosomes to lysosomes. And if we quantify this, we need to see that we can partially um, restore the defect in lysosomal degradation caused by infection. Now, the fact that we can do this at all, which actually suggests that EMCV does not inhibit autovagosome lysosome fusion per se, because we can still activate and increase this process. Now, of course, the second interesting question then becomes, okay, if we're steering more autovagosomes towards degradation, what then happens to the amount of autovagosomes that become uh, released? And the answer is actually that nothing happens. Um, we see that the amount of LC3 release is unaffected by either rapamycin treatment uh, or a drug that has a similar effect um, but then by a different mechanism which is amiodarone and in addition to improved auto degradation improved autophagic degradation not affecting secretory topology we also see that increasing autophagic degradation does not affect the amount of viruses packaged in these so if we sum this up um 
We believe that during C virus infection, but only in the presence of the leader, we see the activation of a secretory arm of the autophagy pathway. And this pathway will increase the virus packaging in EVs, as well as result in the release of LC3 positive EVs. Now, this represents a novel role ascribed to the MCV leader protein and is a second uh, reason why we can explain this protein is so important for EV and close virus release. Uh, and to the best of our knowledge, uh, this is also, in fact, uh, the first study where it was really able to show with a gain of function experiment that there is indeed a link between secretory autophagy and specifically the virus packaging in EV. Uh, mechanistically, uh, we believe that the induction of secretory autophagy in the presence of the leader is not tied to defects in autophagism degradation, as we see that this can still happen in these cells and that the rate of degradation does not really seem to affect uh, our secretory arm. And instead, we really urge um, uh, further research into what type uh, of L3 positive compartments are actually formed, what type of, uh, type of secretory autophagy is really happening during infection. Um, and maybe we should really focus also on the positive regulators of this system instead of the negative regulators of degradation. So that being said, we've reached the end of the paper. So I'm going to take a step back with you and I reflect on what did we learn and why do we think these studies are so important. I think the first and foremost thing that is really important to take home is that virus host interactions regulated by a single viral protein can already strongly affect the amount and type of these released during infection. Um, meaning that um, these systems are really, um, yeah, subjected to a whole layer of regulation um, that we're just not aware of at the moment. Uh, but we should be, because we see that the changes in UV release that can be induced by this interaction strongly affect the amount of EV and close virus that's released, meaning that they have a direct role uh, in influencing uh, virus spread, disease progression, and the role EV plays in this process. Now, we believe um, that identifying viral regulators of this process in model viruses such as EMTV, um, as we've done here for the EMTV leader protein, is very important to help us narrow down the search for the host processes that are regulating this process. And in the end, of course, every virus will have a slightly different viral protein, um, but what they all have in common is that they target the same host cell systems. Meaning that it's very likely that if our EMC virus has evolved um, a specific regulatory pathway, that this similar pathway will also be targeted by other clinically relevant viruses. Now, one of these uh, wholesale processes that can regulate eating such virus fleas that we found in this particular paper is the activation of secretory autophagy. And uh, I really hope that by showing you that secretory autophagy can promote EV and close virus release, uh, this uh, is a very interesting and very relevant disease model uh, to study the crosstalk between autophagy and EV release. Um, that being said, I'm going to quickly look at the time, which is also okay. Um, if it's possible, I'm going to take like two minutes uh, before we head to the general discussions uh, to talk about some of the things that we've been addressing uh, since we published this paper. Um, so there's a couple of follow-up questions we've often gotten and that we're really tackling uh, in the lab right now, which may be interesting for you guys to mention. So one of the questions we often uh, get is, can our findings be reproduced in other cell models? And basically the answer is yes. Um, we've shown a similar phenomena in the different cell lines, but are also now in the process of repeating our experiments in differentiated cells derived from pluripotent stem cells. And although we do see that there are some uh, cell type dependent differences, overall we see a lot of commonalities between these different models. Now, the second question is, um, are our findings unique to EMSV or do we already have some indication and indeed we can translate what we learn from this model virus to other pathogens? And the answer is no. Um, what we're finding is definitely not unique to this EMSV virus. And so in fact, um, we've already uh, basically also published this uh, because like EMCV, um, the virus Coxsackie B3 uh, has already been shown before to induce the release of LC3. And in a paper we published around the same time as we published the paper we discussed today, um, we actually found uh, one specific host factor that was very important in regulating secretory topology during Coxsackie virus infection. So what we saw is that if you knock out this protein called PFAP, and this strongly in reduces uh, virus-induced LC3 secretion. And then along with the loss of this LC3 secretion, we also saw a strong decrease in the amount of EV and close virus release. 
Uh, so there's definitely parallels between EMSV and other viruses, and secret autophagy seems to be um, a more generally target pathway by viruses. And of course, uh, the final and maybe the biggest question we've been tackling since is that we still want to know how exactly the activity of the leader affects EV release and is able to activate secret autophagy. So what we're now doing is that we are taking a look at all the different effector functions of EMCV and we're trying to categorize which of these are important for the induction of vesicle release and which ones um, are not. And this is a manuscript that is currently in preparation. I really hope it's going to be submitted very soon. Um, so stay tuned for this, and especially if you're interested in your studies in the role of stress pathways in regulating vesicle release. I think this is going to be uh, an interesting read for you as well. Now, that being said, there's a lot of people I have to thank for making this work possible, uh, especially need, like already mentioned, uh, Susanna, uh, Singyi, uh, Esther herself, of course, uh, Richard Rebold, um, but also our collaborators at the Virology Division, because we work very close together uh, with the virologists on this. Uh, and this is particularly done in collaboration with a group of Professor Dr. Frank von Kuppefeldt. So, that has brought me to the end of a very long talk. Um, so if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Well, it didn't I, seem very long. It was very exciting. So I think the time went very quickly for those of us in the audience. Um, and we're certainly looking forward to learning more from you in the discussion as well. So I'd like to invite you and, and Esther to chime in for any of the questions that come up. For those of you in the audience, those of you who have put your questions, your comments in the chat box, please be ready to uh, turn on your, vi your video if you'd like, um, but certainly your microphone so that we can all communicate about, about your, um, your insights here. All right, so let's start out with uh, Jinja Ju. You have a question about packaging. All right, let me uh, read this question in case the participant can't use the microphone. So is it possible that the virus's nucleic acid will be packaged in the EV by chance, I guess stochastically, and then infect the recipient cell without the presence of a virus particle? Yes, uh, that is actually a really good question. So there's been a lot of talk about also vesicles try, uh, promoting the release of receptor independent um, transfection, um, which um, one of the ways that can take place is indeed if vesicles package RNA molecules, um, which then, of course, if they enter the cytoplasm of another cell, is enough to establish infection. So you don't actually need virus capsids. The only thing a virus really needs is a way to get into the cell. Um, there is still a bit of question on like how how frequent would this process be compared to the actual packaging of viruses themselves in EV? Um, this is something we're actually studying right now. We're using uh, single round infectious particles. So those are viruses that are not able to produce their own viral capsids uh, to try and see how efficiently uh, these long RNA molecules of viruses can be packaged in EVs uh, if the protein capsid is not there and how efficiently these are then transferred to new cells to start infection. And so far, what we see is that it seems to be that this process can indeed take place. It's just not efficient compared to the packaging of extra real virus particles. And this can probably also um, probably also be caused by the fact that the capsid also really helps to condense this viral RNA molecule. So these mole RNA molecules are like 8 kbs long. That's quite large to really be efficiently packaged in a vesicle by chance. Indeed. And of course, that also depends on the exact virus too, correct? So there are some viruses that need to have multiple viral components that are packaged into the virion um, in order to uh, undergo that replication. But then others, you know, all they really need is the is the genome. So, um, so, so very interesting question. Uh, let's go next to James Drummond. James, I see your camera's on. Go ahead. Yeah, I just was still not 100% convinced that you don't have some carryover virus here. So if you treated the EVs with a lipase to get rid of the membrane of the EV, would you then find a viral particle or would it be subject to neutralization? Uh, or do you just have a lot of viral pieces inside your EV? So then the question becomes, are there really insect virus particles in our IV? Do I answer that correctly? Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, that's a good point. Um, you know, we've actually done a lot of uh, detergent treatments um, to see how that would affect also the, the distribution of our virus throughout our gradients. And what we see is that we're normally, uh, if we don't do detergent treatment, we see two peaks of virus, one at the high density and one at the low EV density. If you do detergent treatment, you actually see this low density virus peak disappear and you see an increase in virus particles in your uh, high density your, or your naked virus fractions. So the fact that we can really shift it from one position to the other uh, would indicate that there are really intact virus particles in our EVs. And we have also shown that if you need three EVs with neutralizing antibodies, our EV enclosed viruses are way more resistant to this than our naked virus particles are. Um, so it really seems to be that there is, uh, at least in part, insect virus particles within our EV isolates. Yeah, that, that's why I suggested using a lipase to get away from all the detergent. So then your neutralization would work cleaner. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of uh, difficulty also with, with looking at the neutralization resistance of EV and plus virus particles. Uh, and that is because if you add a lot of antibodies, and especially if you don't wash these away, they can also be internalized by the cells. Uh, and there are some papers that show that um, even though these virus particles become neutralization resistant, they actually become accessible to some antibodies within the endosomal system once they've been released from EVs here. Uh, so sometimes it really also depends on how you set up these experiments indeed, what is the nicest uh, way to really show that it is EV enclosed and neutralization resistant. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks very much, James. Uh, let's go for our next question to Walter Atwood, a question about the leader. Uh, yeah, hi, that was really beautiful work, Kara. Uh, so so it's clear and I'm convinced that the leader is, is necessary to induce secretory autophagy. Is it also sufficient? If you just overexpress the leader protein, will you induce secretory autophagy? That is a very good question. Um, it is one we have not done, uh, not addressed at least. And that is because we see that if you just express the leader protein, this is very cytotoxic. Uh -huh. um, so that makes these experiments a bit difficult because trying to find the right timing and the right doses of, of this protein is, is very challenging. Um, I know other groups have made it work uh, to really try to do any short-term transactions with this protein and see what it does. Uh, but we have not found a system where we're really confident that we were looking at specific effects and that it needs our expression levels were comparable to the ones you would have during virus infection. Great, thank you. Next question from Jonathan Burney. Hi there, great talk. Um, I was very interested in your flow cytometry assay. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about uh, what your limit of detection is in terms of uh, particle size if you're only looking at viruses that are within EVs, or if you can see your virus alone by flow cytometry? Ooh. Um, so the most important thing for at least our flow cytometry approach is that you need a fluorescent signal to be able to detect your particle. Uh, so we do fluorescent thresholding, uh, meaning that only those particles that are fluorescent enough are being measured. Um, so when it comes to size, it's really difficult to say what is your size limitation um, because it's also really more your limitation on your scatter and your fluorescent signal. Um, and I can tell you something about beats and how big the beats are that we can measure, but I don't know if this will really accurately translate into the vesicles that we're seeing. When it comes to the virus particles, can we see them ourselves? Uh, viruses are about 35 nanometers in size, or at least the viruses I'm working with. Uh, which means that we would not be able probably to see this with flow cytometry unless we do a protein labeling. Um, we have tried this, um, but it is not very easy to get the signal then above the threshold of detection. Um, so when it comes to really measuring the coronaviruses, this is not possible, but uh, I know people have used similar uh, techniques to look, for example, influenza viruses or HIV virus particles. Well, you have to fix them, of course, make them biosafe. Um, but you can do this and so you can measure these type of envelope viruses, which are a bit bigger, and especially the ones you can fluorescently label with uh, lipophilic dyes or something, um, you can measure. But in our case, um, what you're seeing here really is only the vesicles themselves. And um, if there's viruses within them or even attached to the surface, I don't think we would be able to, to see this, at least not that we have been able to demonstrate. 
Yeah, what I can add here is that there's now uh, very recently also a, a big paper out uh, describing uh, uh, the, all the aspects of using flow cytometry for uh, EV analysis. Uh, so the people uh, in our group that are involved uh, in this is uh, Estonia, Lozano and Marka Walwen. And uh, I think what is important here is that, uh, yeah, calibration is also being done to see what kind of size of particles and how many fluorescent molecules are actually uh, needed to appear above this fluorescence uh, threshold. And uh, in this way, you can actually yeah, see uh, what is your own uh, flow cytometer capable of. So uh, maybe worth uh, to check this out. All right, thank you very much. So, so what about permeabilization? Could you can you do permeabilization and and uh, you know get detection agents inside the EV? Um, good question. So we we normally run fixed vesicles through flow cytometry. So it would know the fixing itself that doesn't really affect the signal that much. Um, and if you can fix the material, you should also be able to afterwards do a permeabilization type of thing. But we've never tried doing this. Um, also because it would really require uh, the molecules to go into the EVs that are small enough to fit through the pores and through the EV uh, membrane. Um, and maybe with dedicated nanobodies or really small dyes, you might be able to do it. Um, I know, of course, that this is something that people are looking into, especially with development of new essays. And I think even the uh, Microscopy-based and chip assays are really now also trying to look at uh, intraluminal vesicle markers and stainings. Uh, we could try and see what we can learn from the optimizations uh, those people have done to try and see if we can do similar things on flow cytometry. But so far, at least in our lab, we've mostly stuck to doing surface labelings only when analysing uh, our EVs. Okay, very good. Switching topics here a little bit, Kevin McKnight. And Kevin's question is, can your findings be reproduced in infected animals? Ooh, animal models. Um, I would love to uh, to work with animals. Uh, we we are we work at the veterinary faculty, so you would expect that it would be easy. Um, but in fact, we don't try to do a lot of animal experiments. Um, one of the reasons um, was actually cool about these viruses is they they are. Um, used more often as disease models. Um, EMS V virus infection is a model for cardiac disease in pigs. Uh, so sometimes people are doing these infection experiments and also in mice, uh, these viruses are um, able to infect mice very well. Um, so it would definitely be on our wish list to, to get our hands on some serum samples and see what we see here in regards to vesicle release. Um, but so far, at least um, we're really stuck with um, using um, in vitro differentiated cells as the closest thing we can come to read the uh, physiological tissues. Good, very good. Well, let's see here. We have a question here from Jasper Vanden Ende. All right, I will read this one. Uh, beautiful work. Oh, wait, uh, he is there, but uh, uh, Jasper, we cannot hear you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shoot. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. There no, you are. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, awesome. Sorry. Uh, okay, so where was I? Thank you guys for the amazing <laughs> talk. Uh, I was curious about something you mentioned. There's this, of course, this huge effect of uh, EV enclosure of viral particles on the, uh, the tissue distribution you get. You mentioned the blood-brain barrier. I'm curious, is there any data out there on more of the cellular tropism of uh, EV enclosed versus naked viruses? I mean, the interaction with the cell surface will obviously be way different. Are, are there, for example, some cell types which can be infected by viral particles, but not by EV enclosed viruses or vice versa. Have you done any work on that or are you familiar with any work that's out there? Uh, I'm very that is, yeah, a really, really great question. Um, so I know we are working on it right now to try and see also the, the infection efficiency. So if you have an EV derived from different uh, donor cells uh, and uh, add these to different acceptor cells. Um, is EV enclosure, it doesn't really matter which donor or uh, recipient cell combination you have to really see how efficient this infection is. Maybe in some it's more infectious, maybe some it's less infectious. Um, that is something that is still underway. Um, when it comes to work that has already been published, um, as far as I'm aware, um, most work has been done now is to show um, if you have a naked virus binding to the outside of EVs, how this will affect tropism and entry into cells. 
And this has been done for uh, the JC polioma virus, uh, actually by the group of Edward. Um, it has also been done in the context of uh, enterovirus infection. Uh, and what basically uh, people see here um, is that if a cell lacks a virus receptor, but a vesicle will have this virus receptor, then binding of viruses to the outside of vesicles can um, basically help a virus be dragged into the right cell. Um, and that is a way that indeed um, these viruses seem to be able to uh, enter cells more efficiently than a negative counterpart would. Um, this is also done actually done really nicely um, for a Coxsackie virus in a very recent paper. So yeah, there's definitely proof that these vesicles can alter uh, tropism and, and entry efficiency, especially in receptor deficient cells uh, for at least three different viruses. But mostly it's now um, virus to the outside, bound to the outside of EV. So if it's really different for EV enclosed, then what is really then uh, the entire uptake process of EV enclosed viruses, uh, where do they escape the vesicle, do they escape the vesicle or not, and what are then the entry requirements, that is something we still need to figure out. Awesome, thank you. Looking forward to the day. Hey, Lipe, you have a question about rapamycin. Yes, I do. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Awesome. So I just had a question regarding one of the figures that you have. You mentioned in one in the paper that when you treat those, uh, those cells with rapamycin, you see that the viruses are preferentially enclosed into the 10K EV subsets. And I wanted to know a little bit more of your thoughts on that in terms of like, I, I know that rapamycin is upregulating the lysosomal pathway, but is there maybe a side effect an inhibitory function of rapamycin that's preventing those viruses to be enclosed into 100K EVs that we, a from a different EV biogenesis pathway that you guys haven't looked at? Or I don't know, I just yeah. really want to know your thoughts on that. Finally. Yeah. Oh no, my God, we've been thinking about it so much to try and, and explain that finding. Um, so for those of you who haven't read the paper, um, what we see is that rapamycin doesn't change the overall amount of EV enclosed virus release, but we suddenly see that the vesicles that we would norm pe normally pellet at 100K, we now start to pellet at 10K speeds already. Um, so what we think happens is that somehow our rapamycin treatment is changing the sedimentation coefficient of EVs. And what is actually a bit annoying is that we really always like to think of 10K and 100K EVs as really two different things. Um, but of course, is that this boundary is, yeah, it's not that black and white. Um, so it may be that we're dealing here with our 100K EVs or not in fact 100K EVs, but more like 20K EVs and maybe some small changes in EV composition um, can switch them uh, slightly in, in physical properties and then cause them to uh, pellet at different speeds. And it's actually interesting, we, we don't think this is really a rapamycin effect, uh, but we really think this is the result of the, the basically the metabolic state of the cell. Uh, because we've actually seen that if we change medium composition of our cells and our FCS of our cells, uh, that we actually sometimes see very similar effects as you would have rapamycin. And rapamycin is basically also a drug that does nothing but change the nutritional status of your cells a bit. Um, so how to explain it exactly, I'm not sure. Um, I do think it is a very important finding, not because we can explain it, but because we as physical biologists always really like to, to choose if we either study 10K or either study 100K vesicles. And I think this is a really nice experiment to show that, yeah, if we would have decided to only look at one of these populations, we may have drawn very different conclusions. Um, and that is because, at least personally, I think that these vesicle subsets are not maybe always as different as we think it, they are, and yeah. I really, if someone has thoughts on, okay, what really determines how a physical sediment at a certain speed, does everyone really figure this out? Uh, I would love to hear their input on this. Thank you very much. It's definitely very interesting and it's gotten me thinking about the metabolic state, but that seems like a good idea as well. Thank you. Very good. And then we have a couple of questions here from Vladimir Bokun. Um, one is about the amount of protein that was loaded in the Western blots. Um, and this is uh, looking at LC3 and EVs from wild type versus the mutant, um, the mutant uh, infection. And then also, how much of the differences that you're reporting could be attributed to the lower apparent replication efficiency of the virus? So have you, the virus with the mutation, so have you controlled for that? Yeah. Um, first question first. Um, so the amount of uh, material loads, we actually don't load a lot. 
Uh, so we typically work with a T75 flask for our infection. And we see that if we load about a half or, or quarter of that, that is enough to see our LC3 signal. Um, so I don't know if that says something to you compared to what you're maybe doing. Um, but yeah, if I see or hear how many people or how many flasks normally use to detect a signal, I would say that this is actually not that much before we're able to see this, this band appearing already. Um, the second question is a bit more difficult to answer. And it's, it is also a, a really good question and really difficult. Um, because, of course, our mutant virus doesn't replicate as efficiently as our wild type virus, which means that all other viral proteins are also slightly less produced. Um, and it is really difficult to, to say, okay, what is then really replication dependent and what is uh, really dependent on the specific uh, functions that are activated by this protein. Um, there are a couple of things to say about that. Um, one is that there's always so much more virus particles in the cell than are actually being released. Uh, so in that sense, even if you have less virus particles, there should no, not be any short of, of an abundance in the cell of virus particles to become packaged. Uh, so in that sense, we're not really worried about availability being a limiting factor. Uh, when it comes to uh, can we really exclude or control for the fact that we have less replication and this is giving effects, um, this is actually a question we have been tackling in our follow-up piece. And in our follow-up piece, we've also really tried to, to really inhibit only specific effector functions of the eames protein. protein. Uh, and there we can see that we have some conditions uh, where we have see basically no differences in intracellular virus production uh, or a very big spread between intracellular virus production between experiments. Um, and that we still see that even if you have an experiment where our uh, inhibited cells have a higher virus production than our, our wild-type cells, we still see that they're very deficient in EV unclosed virus release. Um, so this is something that is coming um, to, re and we have done a number of dedicated experiments to try and to really show that uh, it is independent of, of over virus production. But I do agree with you, this is very difficult. And it's also, it's a problem that you could say applies to any function as attributed to leader right now, because um, you will always, if you do anything with a virus, you will make it less efficient. That is a good point and challenging. Yeah, one thing we're also thinking about uh, to do it exactly in the same virus and not comparing different virus uh, strains or mutants and non-mutants is uh, to have a very neat way to really interfere in the replication. Uh, because then if you could do that uh, in kind of a dose response, then you could really investigate uh, uh, to what extent that affects the, the release of TV and closed viruses. It's also not so easy because, yeah, None of those uh, uh, inhibitors that we have now uh, uh, can be used in such a controlled way. But that would be uh, one way to really pinpoint the effect of replication on, uh, on the, or the effects of the fascicle release that, uh, that we're seeing. Wonderful. Well, we have reached the end of our hour. And again, it has gone very quickly. Um, I want to thank uh, both Kira and Esther for joining us today and for presenting this exciting work so clearly. Um, and with such uh, with such great answers too to the to the questions and comments and, and thanks everybody for your contributions to the discussion here. Um, so hope that everyone has a great rest of the week, and we look forward to seeing you again on a future EV club. Thank you.